Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by William Croft Dickinson. The Work of Evil Ever since his return to duty from his long illness, Maitland Allen, our keeper of printed books, had been singularly reluctant to grant any access to the special collections which were in his charge. So much so that the rare book room in the library had become well nigh as sacred and as difficult to enter as the secret courts of an eastern harem. Thus, when he suddenly said to me, Come and I'll show you the whole collection, I was taken completely by surprise. I had asked for an early Italian work by Aeneas Silvius. The assistant at the library counter had disappeared with my form. Alan had come back with him. And now, strangely, I was to be shown the whole collection. Was this simply a piece of unexpected good fortune? Or had the old man some ulterior purpose? I had noticed during the last two or three weeks that he had made a point of stopping to talk to me whenever we met in a room or corridor. Had he singled me out in some way from the rest of my colleagues? And if so, why? Everyone knew that his recent illness had made him a little queer. Opening a door marked Staff Only, Alan led the way through a maze of book-lined passages until at last, passing through a heavy steel door, we stopped before an inner iron grill. This he unlocked, and, stepping aside, he ushered me into the room. I glanced around with curiosity, but he gave me time for no more than a quick glance. There they are, he said, pointing to one of the stacks. An extraordinary collection, a frightening collection. The Lucretia Nerealis which you want happens to be in it, but it's very much of a stranger there. For the rest, I hate them, and his voice rose nervously as if in emphasis. I walked over to the stack, but I noticed he did not accompany me. There, as I saw two long rows of beautiful bindings, I murmured something of my appreciation and delight. Reverently taking down one volume after another, I examined the bindings more closely. All were of rich leather, elaborately tooled in a variety of intricate patterns in which whorls and strange cabalistic signs predominated. I also turned to the title pages. Every work was either an incommabulum or of a date early in the 16th century but every work was on the same theme. I ran my eye along the shelves, picking out the volumes which bore titles on their spines. Still the same theme. Why, I exclaimed, turning towards him, they are all on black magic and necromancy. What you might call a collection of evil, or at any rate a collection of evil intent. Who on earth gathered together all this devilry? It looks as though someone was striving hard to find something which should at last work. "'An unfortunate young man whose history you know as well as I do,' answered Alan, slowly. "'John, third Earl of Gowrie. "'You may remember that after studying here he became a law student at Padua, "'and was there said to have dabbled in magic and witchcraft. "'Well, here's his library, or part of it, and I wish it had never survived.' "'Again I noticed the nervous pitch in his voice. "'Well,' I replied lightly, if he did dabble in the forbidden art, he must have found it pretty ineffective. The very number of his books shows that. One would have thought that constant experiments followed by constant failure and disappointment would have been bound to bring disillusion. For a full minute, Alan made no reply. Instead, he gazed at me with an odd look in his eyes. Ineffective, he said at last. I wish to God you were right. Do you see that safe over there? It contains one further book belonging to Gowrie's collection. No one knows it is in there but myself, and now you. That book is the one book which, at last, Gowrie found would work. Listen to me, you must listen to me, and I'll tell you a tale of devilry that has tormented me ever since this collection came in. Then you'll believe in effectiveness. He had pointed to a small safe in a corner of the room. I made a step towards it, but he seized me by the arm. Often I feel I must take the book in that safe and throw it into the middle of the sea, he continued. But I can't do it. I'm too afraid. Only one small book, yet it is evil itself. That one book seizes a man by the throat and strangles him to death. I looked at him in astonishment. Could it be Alan who was saying all this? 
and who was holding my arm so tightly that his fingers were biting into my flesh? Whatever do you mean, I asked, partly disturbed and partly angry at being held as though I were a child faced with something that which might be dangerous. I wish I knew, he replied slowly, and in a quieter tone. All I can tell you is that within the last eighteen months two men have been strangled to death after looking into that book. That's all. I was dumbstruck, and not without reason. We stood there, tense and silent, like two conspirators surprised by something they couldn't name and fearful of what it might mean. The collection came to us towards the end of the war, said Alan, breaking the silence at last. It came from the local antiquarian society, and it came in the wooden boxes in which it had been stored when Gowry House was pulled down in 1805 and in which it had remained, untouched, until we opened those boxes in this very room nearly 150 years later. It is said that the books were discovered in a wall closet which had been paneled in and so lost to sight. It may well be so. Perhaps Gowry himself entombed them that way. Perhaps he, too, tried to rid himself of an evil incubus. Perhaps Gowry put one particular book, with all its fellows, into a hidden closet, as I have put that one particular book into a safe. Perhaps he, too, was afraid to do the one thing he ought to have done. Or perhaps he did something else. Perhaps he put his own curse upon the book that no one should again open its pages and live. That, at any rate, has been its history here. First it was Fraser, who, you will remember, was our professor of chemistry before you came. As soon as the collection arrived, he was all agog to see it. Day after day he was here with his notebook. Working out their formulae, he would say to me. Damned interesting, some of them. But one day he read too much. I hadn't been in the read room that afternoon, and I didn't come here until nearly closing time. Fraser, as usual, was in his seat at the window there. But that afternoon, he didn't look up with his usual cheery nod. Instead, as he looked up at my entrance, I saw that his face was drawn and white. My God, Alan, he said in a strained voice, this book is the devil himself. It should be burned, burned to ashes. He pushed his chair back and seemed to recover himself. Look, he continued, glaring at me with fierce earnestness, I'm putting it here in this empty case. Lock it in and let no one, no one, ever read it again. He strode to that wire-fronted case over there, it was empty then, thrust in the book, and waited for me to lock the door with my master key. Then he pushed past me and went out. It was the last I saw of him. That same night he was found dead in his own room in the lab, strangled, and no one could explain how or why. He had a queer kind of lab coat of which he was very proud, it was like an old-fashioned smock, which was tied by a fancy cord running through the neck. When he was found, his hands were gripping that cord. It had been drawn so tight that it had throttled him. The students working in the lab had seen no one go into his room or come out of it. I knew now that they wouldn't see anyone. I know, too, that Fraser's hands were at that cord in a vain struggle to loosen it and live. No one thought of connecting Fraser's death with the book he had been reading. At first I hardly associated the two events myself. Yet it was not long before I found I was growing frightened of that book, lying by itself in its locked case. I tried to avoid looking at it, but it seemed to force its presence upon me. Perhaps a fortnight passed before I realized the truth. Then, suddenly, I knew. I knew that Fraser's death had been caused by it. Frightened as I was, I still had courage enough to do one thing. Unknown to the rest of the staff, I removed from the library catalog all the entries relating to it. Fraser's death would not go unheeded. No one should read that book again. No one should even know of its existence. Had I dared, I would have burned it, as Fraser had said it should be burned. But I couldn't bring myself to touch it. Already it had me in its power. I was afraid of it. And so young Inglis had to die, a second victim. He had come to us as a part-time student assistant and had quickly proved his worth, so much so that special tasks were soon assigned to him automatically, and at a time when I was unluckily absent for a few days with influenza, he was given the task of checking on the shelf catalog of special collections. You can imagine my horror when, on the day of my return to duty, I found him here holding the book, 
in his hands, open and reading it. As soon as he saw me, he called out. I found an incunambulum, which is not in the catalogue. It's filthy with dust. But I rushed up and seized the thing from him. I shoved it back into the case and relocked the door while he looked at me open-mouthed. But what could I say? I simply dare not tell him the truth. As I saw it, to tell him the truth would be to tell him his own sentence of death. I made some feeble excuse, which I know he didn't believe, and sent him off. Then I sat down, sick and faint. What could I do to save him? Nothing. He was doomed. The evil thing was upon him, and he could never escape. I cursed myself for my own cowardice. Why, at least, had I not warned him? Had the book so laid its spell upon me that I even feared the ridicule which might follow my warning? Poor beggar, he didn't escape. When the library was closing that night, one of the staff found that the automatic lift wouldn't work. Naturally, he assumed that someone on one of the floors had failed to shut the door properly, and he went to look. He found the door which wasn't shut. He also found Inglis. He was trapped by the outer door, and, strangely, he was trapped by the neck. Almost as though he had entered the lift and then, as the door was sliding too, had put his head out to look at something. Stranger still, but only to those who didn't know what I knew, the poor fellow was dead. I tell you, the pressure of the outer doors on that lift is so light that you can hold them back easily with one hand. Yet Inglis was dead. He had been throttled by the light pressure of a lift door. Fraser had been strangled on the day he had opened the book. So had Inglis. Can you wonder that the same night I had what was called a nervous breakdown? I was away for over a year, and, as you probably know, I have only been back for some six months or so. Surprisingly, I have kept my reason, though sometimes I am not sure. Perhaps I am mad, or perhaps I am suffering from some delusion. Yet I was the only person who knew that Inglis had opened the book. I was the only person who knew that Inglis was doomed to die, and he did die, and Fraser died. God forgive me. I should destroy the thing, but I daren't. I am too afraid of it. Yet about a fortnight ago, the day I spoke to you in the upper hall, I was brave enough to move it out of the bookcase and lock it away in that safe. You gave me the courage to do that, even though you didn't know you had done so. Now I'm afraid again. I feel it is laughing at me behind that steel door and biding its time. You must forgive me, but I had to tell you all this. One day I, too, may be found strangled, and you, at least, will know the reason why. As you may imagine, I was not particularly pleased at having this extraordinary burden of knowledge so suddenly thrust upon me. Yet, as I crossed the quad back to my own room, my thoughts ran in a different vein. Poor old Alan, I thought. No wonder he had a breakdown. No wonder he is queer. Fancy living with that on your mind all the time. Poor wretch. A victim to his own imagination. With a harmless book locked up in his safe, and fearing it as though it possessed all the malignant power of some genie in the Arabian Nights, and mortally afraid to do the one thing which would bring relief. But I did Alan an injustice. I had given my lecture next morning, and was talking to a student in my retiring room, when Wallace, one of the lecturers in the Modern Languages Department, and Alan's next-door neighbor, opened the door and beckoned me outside. "'Did you know Maitland Allen was dead?' he asked. Dead, I repeated. Yes, apparently last night he was all worked up about something. Kept walking up and down his study, saying in a loud voice, I will do it, I will do it, and generally worrying his housekeeper out of her wits. Then, suddenly, about nine o'clock, she heard him go into the hall. Peeping round her door, she saw him put on a cap, his scarf and his overcoat, and literally rush out of the house. By this time thoroughly alarmed, she came to us, but she was so upset that in the end I offered to go back with her and to wait up with her for Alan's return. He didn't come in until nearly two o'clock in the morning. We heard him open the front door and then, just when he had shut it again, we heard him give a queer kind of strangled, choking cry. We rushed into the hall and saw him half hanging from the door and half sprawled on the rug in the hall. One end of his scarf had caught in the door as he had shut it, and, 
When he had turned away, it had pulled tight round his neck and had trapped him. We opened the door at once and released him, but when we tried to help him to his feet again, we discovered to our horror that he was dead. I came over to tell you, for I believe he had taken quite a liking to you. But I was no longer listening. My thoughts were rushing madly towards one word which seemed to loom larger and larger. And the one word was strangled. Fraser, Inglis, Allen. Could it all be coincidence? Or could such things be true? Naturally, the procurator fiscal conducted an inquiry into Allen's death. A boatman stated that Allen, whom he identified, had knocked him up about midnight and had asked to be rowed a full mile out to sea. At first he had demurred, for Allen had seemed fair demented, but an offer of five pounds had seemingly settled the matter. He had rowed Allen out to sea, and when he told him that they were well beyond the full mile for which he had been asked, Allen, to his utter surprise, had suddenly plucked a small book from his coat pocket, had raised it with both hands above his head, and had hurled it down into the water with all his force. Then, said the boatman, he crouched himself down in the boat as though he were afraid someone was going to hit him, and he stayed like that till I tied up again, when he jumped out of the boat and fair ran along the quay as if the devil himself was chasing him. The doctors were puzzled but unanimous. Despite the softness and natural elasticity of the scarf, they had been surprised to find a sharp mark around Alan's neck. But they were convinced he had died of shock. His heart, they said, was in poor condition. Any shock would probably be too much for it. And I alone knew what that shock would be. I alone knew what would flash through the poor wretch's mind when he felt that sudden, unexpected tightening of his scarf around his neck. So much I had written yesterday when my mind was free. But how different is today? Today all Alan's fear and dread are now my own. Today, at the close of the library committee, our librarian spoke casually, as of a matter of little importance. He had looked over the rare book room, he said, after Alan's death, and there he had found, inside the safe, a book that belonged to the Gowrie collection, but which, to his surprise, had no entry in the catalogue. Dazed and bewildered, I have found my way back to my room, and, as I write this down, I am a prey to every wild imagining. Can it be that Alan, deranged and overwrought on that last fearful night, cast the wrong book away? How could he? It was the only book within that safe. Yet reason recoils from that other thought, that a book can return from the depths of the sea. Reason? How long can reason prevail against this fearful question that is now pulsing through my mind? Already our librarian has handled the book and opened it. The End